words are tender parched. And uh, Lord, guide my mouth, guide my mind. And uh, Lord, encourage your people tonight. Lord, wisdom. I don't walk through life without it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. James chapter 3, James chapter 3, uh, we kicked this off last Wednesday night. I'll take just a few moments and uh, review for us, get up where we need to be. But in James chapter 3, uh, we see in one verse four keys that God gives us to live wisely. Four keys in one verse that God gives to us to live wisely. It's in verse number 13 of James chapter 3. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? God goes on to say, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. Wisdom is something that we cannot hide. Uh, it's something that is not sort of incognito. God says, let him, let him show. Uh, it's going to be obvious. Uh, we gave the example that a fool is wise until he opens his mouth and then he takes away or removes all uh, doubt whatsoever of, of his foolishness. And so as we look at wisdom uh, as uh, outlined in the Word of God, Proverbs especially highlights the value and the importance of wisdom. Proverbs we saw last week in chapter 4 says wisdom is the principal thing. Uh, if we want to narrow down and summarize what's uh, the order of importance that God has for us, God says wisdom is going to be the principal thing. It's going to be on the top of the list that we'll look at. Then it says, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and her in the, in the feminine pronoun there is referencing back to wisdom. Exalt wisdom, and she, your wisdom, shall promote thee. She, your wisdom, shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her or embrace wisdom. And so uh, wise people are going to make wise choices and go down a wise path. We don't always make wise decisions, but our desire and goal ought to be a wise person. There's many times in life where we'd say, uh, I need wisdom in this decision. I'm at a crossroad in my life. I need wisdom. I need direction. I need God's insight of what God would have me to do. Uh, wisdom, there's a lot of different definitions we can look at, but I define it as this. It's a skill for living a godly life. It's a skill for living a godly life. Uh, there's earthly wisdom, uh, sensual wisdom. The Bible says it is here from below. And uh, then there's heavenly or above wisdom that's from above. And uh, our desire is not just to have an earthly wisdom. Uh, we want to have a heavenly wisdom. We want a wisdom that's from above. That's the wisdom from God. To make decisions, the Bible gives us God's perspective concerning every topic, every area of life that you're concerned about. God reveals what His opinion is what his perspective is. And so a wise person searches the mind of God, the Bible, and then he finds what God's position or perspective is concerning a specific topic, a particular topic, and then a wise person then applies what he's just learned from God's Word. It's foolish to learn something and then not put it to practice in regards to what God says. And so as we look at the question that's given where it says, who is a wise man uh, among you? Uh, the question's asked, and then he gives us four different um, ways that we can understand the importance of wisdom. We see first and foremost, uh, we saw it last week, that uh, the key number one is a seeking heart. Who is wise among you? So wisdom uh, is much more than just the accumulation of facts and information. Uh, it is something that you must want more than anything else in your in your. Uh, uh, your goals and your dreams and the direction you're going in life. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God the gift to all men liberally. And so God's desire is to give us wisdom. The Bible says the principal thing, get wisdom. Yeah, I want wisdom. And God says, I want to give it to you. And all you have to do is ask. Remember we made the statement last uh, Wednesday that uh, the most important daily prayer request we ought to pray is, Lord, give me wisdom. Because if God says, if you need wisdom, we need it every day of life. Don't limit wisdom just to what we consider the big events, the big decisions, the big crossroads in your life. Every decision uh, has a potential uh, to point you in the right direction or to point us in the wrong direction. So we don't want to minimize the significance of a decision uh, based upon what we decide as being important or unimportant, essential or non-essential. Everything needs to have wisdom. And so we want to find uh, what God's perspective concerning that is. And so we want to look at a seeking heart. Uh, we've got to desire wisdom more than anything else, more than wealth. We must have wisdom more than popularity and fame and, and, and uh, uh, notoriety and, and uh, accolades, all the things, the materialistic uh, goods that we might accumulate. More than anything we ought to have. Solomon said what? What do you want? God asked Solomon. He said, I'll give you anything you want. And Solomon said, I'll take wisdom. 
And did God give him everything else? He had wealth and, and the popularity. He had all of that, uh, but he had wisdom. First and foremost was what he desired, and God uh, gave him uh, well beyond just that. And so all of us, if we truly seek after wisdom, we'll find it. And uh, God said, just ask, just ask. And uh, God said, I'll give it to you. So as you make decisions in life, as you're at crossroads in your life, say, God, I, I, I need wisdom in this area. I don't care if you've... Uh, uh, done that job for 20, 30 years. It doesn't matter uh, if you're experienced in that particular trade or crap you're involved in. See, I've done this all the time. I don't need to ask God wisdom more so. Uh, you need to ask God's wisdom and insight and say, God, I want your wisdom, your insight, your guidance, your direction in all areas of my life. And then we saw, and we kicked into this one, uh, where the second key is that number one is seeking heart. Then number two, we've got to make some smart choices or wise choices. Key number two, who is endued with knowledge among you, who is endued with knowledge among you? Remember, you got in order to, to know, uh, make smart choices. You got to number number one, know what's right. And uh, too often, we don't know what's right. We do what we think is right. Remember, I gave the example uh, last uh, Wednesday night, uh, a message I preached years ago uh, in uh, regards to golfing. That example, uh, when you line up, and you can look like uh, it looks to you. Uh, like uh, that you're lined up straight and you're going to hit the ball straight. It looks straight, uh, but uh, do you know what straight looks like? Uh, that's the question. And so it doesn't matter what looks right to you. Do you know what right looks like? Uh, would you recognize right if it came along? I mean, it looks right, it seems right, it appears right uh, from your perspective, but the guy standing behind you watching you golf is saying, what are you aiming at? And, well, of course, I'm aiming at the, the flag there on the, on the whole. That's what, well, according to the way you're lined up, you're going to miss it. And, and that's where the Word of God, like a plumb line, what's that? That's a level. Uh, some things can look straight, and you take it with your eye and say, straight enough, looks good. And you put the level on it, and, boy, that level doesn't show it being level because our eye, what we think is right, can be very deceptive. So we've got to have the Bible is a plumb line that we line it up to our marriages, we line it up to our relationships, uh, we line it up to every decision we make in life, and it'll show us what, what's right. And it'll show us uh, so we can begin to recognize what's right. And as we talked about a conscience on Sunday, the more that we uh, learn what God wants us to do, the more we learn what right looks like, then our conscience becomes much more reliable uh, because we're educating it or instructing our conscience which it should be. And then secondly, uh, in order to make smart choices, we have to have the courage to choose what we know is right. We've got to follow through. It's one thing to know what's right. It's another thing to follow through and to do what's right. Now when we look at that word knowledge in verse, um, uh, our text verse here in Jeremiah chapter 3, in verse number 13, the word, Jer the word knowledge, as we saw last Wednesday, means a specialist. A specialist. And so when you go to a doctor, uh, you find a specialist that specializes in whatever that uh, disease or, or uh, health issue that you have, you go to a cardiologist if you have a heart issue, or you go uh, to a podiatrist if you have a, a foot issue, or you go to, you know, so you have an oncologist for, for cancer, whatever the specialist might be. So God says that God wants us to be a specialist concerning wisdom. We need to be the type of person that is a specialist of what God would have us to do. There's only two ways we saw of uh, how we can become a specialist, people and pain. Remember that? Uh, the people you hang around will determine how wise you are. A companion of fools, the Bible says you're going to go about and leave about to destruction, but a companion of what? Wise men. And uh, hang around uh, wise people. Uh, don't hang around your peers because uh, you have uh, commonalities and similarities. You like the same team. Hang around wise people. That's older people. That's where older, the, the gray head is, is so valuable. Uh, because uh, we can glean from the wisdom. The Bible says that the older men uh, and the older women are to mentor and instruct and guide and to be an example for the younger generation to follow. And so uh, people uh, will help us to become a specialist as we glean from them. And then also pain. There's something about pain that, uh, that brings us to a place of a specialist. When you've gone through uh, the, uh, the hardships and the trials and the adversities of life in a specific area of life, you, are, uh, you, unlike anyone else, are able to identify with that person and help that individual. Maybe you've gone through divorce. 
And uh, as an individual that suffered the pain and the heartache and the hurt of a divorce, you can then, as a specialist, take out God as helped you and strengthened you and rebuilt your life and that you can be uh, an encouragement to someone else that maybe is going through a difficult time in their marriage. Maybe you've lost a child uh, in death and as a parent you can come alongside someone else that's lost a child and you can encourage them. You're a specialist. You've gone through that. Uh, You've lost a spouse and uh, you've lost a parent and uh, so now you've experienced that. You've experienced the grace of God, the presence of God and so through the pain of life you become a specialist in that area. So you can come alongside, encourage and comfort and strengthen and, and reassure them that God will help you through this. He helped us and he helped me and he helped my home and my life and my family. And then you can encourage and use them in that area. So pain and people will help us there. The Bible talks about in Job 23 uh, that we go through the furnace of affliction and God says we'll come forth as gold. Now, tonight also I want to build now as we build on this thought of that word knowledge. Not only is that word knowledge uh, mean that uh, you're a specialist, though that's the primary meaning of it, the word knowledge also deals with making right decisions under pressure. Making right decisions under pressure. A specialist is someone that knows how to make more times than not, a right decision in a very pressured moment. Uh, someone's in, in a surgical uh, uh, unit and, and uh, there they are and he's doing these, uh, he's a specialist in his field of trade. And so what's I mean? He's got to make uh, pressure decisions. Uh, maybe there's uh, some blood that, that, that's, that's uh, not supposed to be uh, uh, bleeding or maybe there's some, some, something else that's shown up and, in the surgery. And so the pressure of the moment, he's got to make some right decisions. And so he's got his team there, as anesthesiologists, and he's got uh, the nurses and the helpers and things there. But knowledge that James has in mind here is ability to make wise choices, right choices under pressure. Now there's a kind of pressure that can either inflate a tire or it can deflate your confidence. A pressure can go in one of two directions. There's a pressure that can cause you to do right or can cause you to do a wrong action. There's a kind of pressure that's able to cause pain. But there's also a kind of pressure that can stop bleeding. And so pressure in of itself is not bad, but if we don't know how to make wise decisions and right decisions uh, and under under times of pressure, then we're going to make a lot of wrong decisions. And so God said, I want you to have knowledge. I want you to be a specialist. I want you to be able to make some right decisions when the pressure's on. Listen, we sometimes don't have a week to pray and prepare to make a right decision. If we had 48 hours to think about it and seek counsel and guidance, then yes, we may make a right decision. But life doesn't work that way. Sometimes at the crossroad of life, right now, you got to make a right decision. The pressure's on. You've got the wrong crowd at work trying to press you to do the wrong thing. You're put in a situation to where you might have to make a wrong choice. And the pressure's on. And if you're not wise and endued with knowledge to be a specialist, then you're more likely to make a wrong choice in that time of pressure. You don't have time to think about and pray about and get right with God about it. It's a pressure moment. And we can look, all of us can look back at times in our life when we were put into a pressure position. And sad to say, we look back with regret. And I said, boy, I, I made a wrong choice. And I, I made a foolish choice. And, and I was pressured, uh, almost like, uh, you know, you're at the car lot and, and, the, and the dealer saying, listen, this is it. And, and we've got three other guys coming to look at the car. And, and if you walk off the lot, then this price may not be uh, the same price tomorrow. The car may not be here. Pressure, pressure, pressure. And if, you don't be able, if you're not able to make a pressure, a wise choice, when the pressure's on, then guess what's going to happen? You're going to end up wrecking and ruining not only your life, but those that are depending upon you. We must be a specialist in making uh, decisions under pressure. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight uh, as uh, we look at this thought of the ability to make wise choices under pressure. Under pressure. Uh, the guys at work are all of a sudden uh, uh, talking about some things they ought not to talk about. You're put in a position. Pressure. What choice are you going to make in that decision? You're gathered with family and friends and and, uh, things begin to come up and topics begin to be talked about and and, and situations begin to arise. You're putting in the pressure, a peer pressure of your family, peer pressure at work, and there's pressure that's there. How will you respond? Will you be wise uh, when the pressure is placed on? Most of us can make wise choices if we have some time to think about it. 
if we have some time to uh, dwell upon it. But life doesn't usually work that way. Take your Bibles and go to Philippians chapter number 1 and verse number 10. Philippians chapter number 1 and uh, verse number 10. We're looking at tonight uh, how to be wise. Of course, four keys of wisdom. We've got to learn how to make smart choices. Part of making a smart choice, we've got to be a specialist. That's what the word knowledge means. As we look at knowledge, it's not just being a specialist that, that specializes in, in, in the wisdom of God, but it's also being able to be so wise that when under pressure, when back to the corner, when caught off guard, when surprised, you still make the right choice. And, and that's the test of your wisdom, your character, uh, your spirituality, is when you're put in a corner, when you're caught off guard, what choice do you make? And uh, we're not always going to probably make the right choice, but our goal should be to be a specialist and be prepared for those pressure moments as a surgeon or as a specialist uh, is uh, prepared for. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 10. Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 10. I'm sure Sister Sarah, through some of your training, they've prepared you for pressure events huh? and uh, things that may go wrong. You look at all the certain scenarios that could come up, and they never cover all the scenarios because there's no way you can. Military, going off to boot camp, and all the preparation, they, they're trying to prepare you for all types of different uh, ambushes and type of attacks and, and type of warfare and all types of stuff. And they're trying to prepare you so you don't crack under pressure, so you don't choke under pressure, so you don't uh, make a dumb choice under pressure. And God says, I want you as a child of God not to choke and not to mess up your life when their pressure's on, because it will be. And Satan's after as an adversary to wreak havoc in our lives and to put pressure on. And when the pressure's on, we got to make a right choice. we got to make the, the wise choice. Philippians chapter 1, and look what it says in verse number 10, that you may approve. So look at this little phrase there, approve things that are excellent. Those few words there, what do we got? Five words there, approve things that are excellent. God said, I want you to approve things that are ex excellent that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Uh, that which can be classified as excellent is this. Something that stands out separate and distinct from the average or common things. Uh, you can look at someone, but there's someone at work that has excellent work uh, ethics. Uh, there's someone to, uh, at, uh, at your job that, that is excellent uh, in regards to their punctuality. And there's someone that's excellent in their penmanship. And there's someone that's excellent uh, in what they do. What does that mean? It means they're above just the normal. Uh, they're above just the, the average and the nominal. Uh, it's something that excels beyond that, uh, distinct from just what is common. It's that which is better or excelling in value. This would be a great uh, series of Sunday school lessons that we could do, and you could do as a Bible study, but there's a number of things God calls excellent in Scripture. Uh, God says uh, the more excellent way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 31, God says in Daniel 5, 14, that we ought to have excellent wisdom. Uh, we see in Daniel chapter 5, verse 12, that Daniel had an excellent spirit. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, it says they made a what? More excellent sacrifice. In Hebrews 8, 6, it talks about a more excellent ministry. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, uh, it talks about a more excellent name. And so God said, there's some things that, that are above the normal, they're above the average, and, and I want want you to live your life to approve things that are excellent. Not just that's better than what well, I could do. I, here's where most of our, well, I could have done worse. I, I could have done a lot bad. Uh, worse, I, I could have made a, a lot but worse decision. Listen, don't compare to how bad it is that you did better than the bad. Compare it to what? Approve yourself to what's excellent. Could you have done better? Could you have uh, been a better friend? Could you have walked with God in a better way? Could you have an excellent spirit, a better spirit? If you can do more, then God said that's what excels that comes above. And he says, I want you to prove things that are excellent. We need to be able to identify what's excellent in life. We need to embrace then what's excellent in life. And then you need to spend your time, your energy, and resources uh, supporting what's excellent. Too many of us waste our time and energy on things that are not excellent. They're temporal. Uh, they're wood, hay, and stubble. There's no eternal value. And God said, listen, find those things in your life, in your home, in your ministry, in your purpose that's excellent. And then live your life for what is approving unto excellent. Don't just make it by. Don't just make ends meet. Don't just slide on through and say, well, I could have done a lot worse. No, but you could have done a lot better. 
approved to be more excellent. So always evaluate uh, that. And so God's people need to have excellent wisdom so that under pressure they'll make excellent choices. And so God says, life's going to feel the pressure. And uh, it, you're going to feel the pressure uh, at work. You're going to feel the pressure uh, with your finances. You're going to feel the pressure uh, with your peers. You're going to feel the pressure as you get older and you're up in years. You're going to feel the pressure with some health issues. You're going to feel the pressure of some relationship challenges. You're going to feel the pressure of the hardships of life. And he says, when the pressure comes, you must have an excellent wisdom to decide what is the best choice, the excellent choice, the wise choice to make. And so we must have wisdom from God to choose what is best uh, when we don't have a lot of time to make up our minds because sometimes we just don't. Uh, there's no time to, to sort of think about it and call and get some advice and counsel. You've got to make the best choice. It's under pressure. Uh, a, a surgeon uh, there at the moment, he can't go back and relook at his logs and books and, and uh, call his professor and say, what do I do? Too late now. He's at the moment. He's got to make some decision. Same thing with a soldier on the battlefield, a policeman, uh, brother Bob, uh, out on the the force and out on there. You got to make those decisions, and and decisions have to be sharp and right. And uh, because your your whole uh, career sometimes uh, uh, may be on the line as a result of that. One of the keys to making wise decisions under pressure is found in Psalm twenty five. Verse 12, this is a great verse. I never saw this before. I've mean, read the verse many times, but I never saw it in this way before, uh, as I'm going to share with you tonight. Look at Psalm 25 and uh, verse number 12. Psalm 25 and verse uh, number 12. So God says, uh, I, I want you to be wise, and I want you to be able to have knowledge. What's that? A specialist. A specialist in what? Wisdom. I want, to have, I want to be a specialist in wisdom so uh, when questions are asked or decisions need to be made or crossroads are there, I'll make a wise choice. But he said, I not only want to be a, 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 a specialist, I also want to be able to be able to make wise choices when under pressure and uh, to be able to get in there. Uh, they used to say uh, uh, in sports, that uh, you know the last inning and the game's tied or the winning guy you know the winning runs up on, on third base and the batter gets up. Uh, if you're out there and, and, and in the field, I played shortstop a little bit. And if you're thinking, I hope they don't hit the ball to me. I hope they don't hit the ball to me. I hope. And sure enough, crack of the bat, here comes a ball and you freeze and, and lock your knees and, and you get in the air, it goes through your legs. Whatever. But if you're there, say, boy, I hope they hit the ball. I want to be the last out. Don't don't hit these other guys. They're going to mess it up. I hope they hit it to me. And so you want to be under pressure. They bring in, uh, I was uh, in um, uh, college, and then uh, when drafted by the Braves, my position was short relief. Short relief is a pitching position, and uh, you don't start. Uh, usually are brought in from the bullpen. Uh, we watch the game way out from left field or right field. And, uh, but using the eighth or ninth inning, when the game's closed, either it's tied or your, team, your, your team's up ahead uh, by a run or two, then uh, you warm up and you come in on that uh, last inning or so, and you got to get, you know, there's usually a couple of runners on base, and the tying runs at home, or the tying runs on third, and the short relief pitcher comes in. In a pressure moment, you got to get that guy out. And, and I love the opportunity to be able to come and be a part of that stage of the game. Not everybody enjoyed that stage, but we got to be able to, as a Christian, be able to, to make wise choices, right choices, uh, when pressure. Look at this verse here in uh, Psalm 25 and verse number 12. Psalm 25, verse number 12. Here's a key of making wise decisions when under pressure. Here it is. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. So God's guidance is promised to those that fear him, right? Look what it says. It says, uh, what man is he that feareth the Lord? So that's, that's a good question. Do you fear God? And uh, him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And so God says, I, I want to guide you, but I can only guide you if you have a fear of God. Uh, that fear of God is, God, I want to please you. I want to do what's right. I, I often have said uh, uh, in uh, the, the levels of fear uh, that we grow in, spiritual uh, immature fear uh, as a child, same thing as a Christian, young ch Christian child, uh, immature fear is where you, you do wrong fearing the hurt and punishment that will be inflicted upon you. And he said, well, I don't want to do wrong because my dad is going to punish me. And your fear of punishment or receiving the punishment is what hopefully prevented you from doing the wrong and doing the right. That's why the Bible says, spare the wrong, spoil the child. So there's that fear that's there as an immature, but as you grow, there comes a time where you're not afraid of being hurt by doing wrong 
But as a child, you go to the point to where you don't want to do something wrong that would hurt your parents. You still fear hurt, but it's not a fear you do to hurt yourself if you do wrong, the punishment that comes, the consequences that come. You fear doing something wrong that would bring hurt and disappointment and shame to your mom and dad. Uh, same thing as a Christian. Immature fear uh, is a lot of young Christians running around saying, i got to be in church. Why? If I'm not obeying God, if I'm not serving God, then God's going to chasten me and God's going to zap me and God's going to get me in. i got to get in church. And, and that's all right. That's a beginning fear that we all start with. But we've got to grow to a place in our Christian lives where our fear of God is not the, the pain that will come our way for disobedience or the, the hardships that will come our way because of disobedience, but because we fear hurting God. And we say, no, I don't want to do that because that would hurt God. That would hurt the cause of Christ. That would hurt, hurt my testimony for the cause of Christ. That would hurt the family of God and my church. I wouldn't want to do that and act that way. And so see how the maturity of fear. And so God says, uh, those that fear God, uh, God says, I'm gonna, what I'm going to teach them uh, in the way that he shall choose. Now, as we look at this, God is omniscient. And so if God's omniscient, shouldn't we go to him? and ask for guidance concerning what choice we should make in life. He is all-knowing. That's what the word omniscient means. And that's what he said. If he will ask wisdom, ask. If it's a principal thing, it ought to be the most important prayer request you pray, and that's what I need wisdom today. As a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as an employee, as an employer, I need wisdom today in all areas of my life. And then God says, now, when you're praying for that, God's omniscient. So that means God knows everything. God knows what's going to happen before it even happens. So we pray for wisdom from the one who knows everything. And God will give us direction. Often we go to everybody else for advice, don't we? Or we don't think we need anybody else's advice because we know it will make us happy. We know, we've been down the, the block, we rode long enough. We've been around the block a few times. We know uh, what, uh, what to do uh, in regards to what the will of God might be for us. And so we look for those type of things. And notice the thought here. I want to show you something. Look back at this verse here. It does not say, let's read it specifically now. It does not say that he shall teach him the way. It doesn't say that. Look at your verse there. It doesn't say if you fear the Lord, he'll teach you the way. Does it? It doesn't say that. Now we imply that it says that. When you fear God, he'll show you the way to go. It doesn't say that. Look what it says. It says here, so it says, uh, it says, uh, it says uh, if you fear him, what? Him shall he teach in, in what? In the way that he shall choose. So God will teach you what choice to make as you make the daily choice to walk in the way. Many of us are making wrong choices because we're saying, God, what way do you want me to go? And God says, I've showed you the way to walk in. If you'd walk in the way that I've shown you, then I'll be able to help you choose the choices you want to make. As you're walking in the way, I'll show you the choices to make. That's what wisdom under pressure is all about. We want God, show me the way. God says, get in the way, and I'll help you choose what choice to make. But too often we're waiting for God to give us the way. To go. Uh, and so while you're walking in the way in which you should go, God will teach you what you should choose. So don't worry about what way you should go. You know what way you should go. You've been saved long enough. You know how you ought to live the Christian life. So as you're doing right, God will then show you the choices to make. Uh, that's why the Bible says that uh, uh, the fruit of the righteous tree of life and he that wins his souls is what? Wise is wise. God gives a wisdom to one who's actively, uh, 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 consistently sharing their faith. And as you share your faith, God gives you a wisdom that he doesn't give somebody else. And so God says, as you're doing right, I'll help you choose what choice you need to make. As you're serving God, I'll show you what choices to make at the crossroads of your life. But if you're waiting for me to show you the way, he said, I've already done that. Get in the way. And then I'll show you the choices to make as you're in the way. This will help us make choices, wise choices, under pressure if we're doing what we know is right to do. You're in the way. You're doing what you know is right. And God then can help choose or help you choose the right choices on, on the process as you go. So if, as we look at this then, let me, we just got a few moments left. I was hoping to get a little bit, a little bit further on this here. But uh, if, if wisdom is a principal thing, uh, if God says, I want you to have knowledge, which is be a specialist, 
and be able to be a specialist at making wise choices under pressure. Yeah, any of us give us enough time, we'll make the right choice. But you don't have that opportunity all the time. You don't have that option. That's not an option that you've got all the time. Sometimes you've got to make it quickly. And so what's a plan that we ought to have for making wise decisions under pressure? We ought to have a plan. Life is full of pressure. And uh, they're going to try, the devil's going to try to pressure us uh, through peer pressure and family pressure and financial pressure and health pressure and all the things that we've got out there. And so the pressure is going to come. So if it's going to come, we're more likely to make wrong choices when we're under pressure. But if we learn to make right choices and be prepared for when the pressure comes, as a military tries to prepare for pressure out in the field, as a surgeon tries to prepare for all the different scenarios, as a nurse tries to prepare for all the different scenarios that can come up, they're trying to prepare for the pressure moment. So they'll make the right choices more often, not all the time, but more often than not, because they've learned to make right choices on the pressure. So we better have a plan for that. So number one, a uh, plan to make wise choices, wise decisions, under pressure. Number one, let's clear out our heart of any known sin. Let's clean out our heart. Let's clear out our heart of any known sin. You see, sin introduces confusion into our mind and hinders us from re receiving divine direction. You want to know what's right to do, but if, you're, you've, got if you've got sin that's, that's unconfessed, you're not walking in the way. So don't expect God to show you the choice to make the way to go if you're not currently in the way you know you should be doing. It's uh, foolish to say, God, I want to know your will for this area of my life. And you're not doing these wills of God that you know are obvious that you should be doing. You're, you're sporadic in your Bible reading. You're sporadic in your tithing. You're sporadic in sharing your faith. You're sporadic in, you can look at all these things. You say, I know to do those things. But if I'm not walking in the way, then when under pressure, I'm going to make some wrong choices. I'm going to make some, so sin, we got to clean out our heart. The Bible is the record, uh, uh, re records the mind of God and the heart of God for you and I. Those of us who heed the words of God are wise obedient, spirit-filled. Those that don't heed the word of God are going to be um, hindered and uh, confused concerning what God's direction is. And so God says, let's clean up our heart concerning uh, what, uh, what's uh, clogging or confusing us from divine direction. Uh, before you can hear from the Lord, you got to clear out anything in your heart and life that's clouding and blocking your thinking and guidance. God's trying to guide you, but if you can't hear and see the direction and, and see the promptings of that. So how do you do that? How do you clear up your heart? Here's what you do. First thing, you ask God to reveal to you anything in your heart that's not pleasing to him. It's not what you don't think is pleasing to him. It's what he doesn't like in your life. I don't see the big problem with this. Uh, that will, you don't follow what you think or feel or what your conscience says. Uh, that's not the final authority. The Word of God is. And so if you're sincerely wanting guidance, if you're sincerely wanting direction in your life, before you can get any direction, you've got to clear up your, the, the fog of your mind of sin. And how you do that? You just got to go and say, God, I, I've got a decision I need to make. But I can't make it with this clouded mind. I, I want it to the best of my ability. I've gotten these things right that I know are wrong. But Holy Spirit of God, God, is there anything in my life that is displeasing to you? And you'll be surprised at the things that God will bring to your attention that you had no idea, hadn't thought about in a long time. And God brings it to your attention. You, you, you say, well, well that, I, I took care of that a while. Well, God, why, why is he bringing it to your attention then? You maybe did not take care of it like you could, should have taken care of it. So ask God to show you if there's anything sinful in your life that is keeping you from hearing the truth. It could be a habit. It could be a wrong relationship. It could be a thought pattern or anything that's contrary to God's will. The Holy Spirit will be faithful to point out whatever needs to be addressed if you ask. Just ask and say, God, I, I need some wisdom. I need to, to make a right choice. And God says, okay, let's clean up your life. God, what is it? Is there anything in my heart? Is there anything in my attitude? Is there anything in my goals and dreams? And is there anything in my life that dishonors you? Would you reveal it to me? And boom, 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 boom. God begins to show it to you. Now, what you do at that point, 
uh, is up to you, but God did his part in revealing it. You can't pick and choose and say, well, I'll take care of this one. I'm not going to worry about these other three. Well, don't you want to have wisdom and instruction and knowledge specialist? Sure you do. So you got to care about it. So number one, ask. Number two, confess. Confess. Once God reveals it to you, confess it to God. Don't excuse it. Don't place blame for it. Uh, don't, ra- you know, don't, don't rationalize it. And say, well, it's not that big of a deal. Confess it. Confession means to agree with God that what you've done or what you've thought or who you've hung out with or the life you're living is wrong. God, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm agreeing with you that what I've done is wrong. I may not see it as wrong, but if God says it's wrong, then I agree with God. He's right. I'm wrong. And so you, can, you um, ask, you confess, and then write, write down this third one if we're trying to clean up our life, then you've got to repent. You've got to repent. What's that mean? That's where you turn away from your sin and say, not again. With your help, God, I'm not going back there. Now, you may go back, but it's not because you've planned to go back. From the best of your ability, you've, you've dealt with it. God, the Holy Spirit's revealed it to you. You've confessed and says, God, I'm so sorry. I have sinned. And it's good when God reveals sin to not just say, Lord, forgive me for all the wrongs I've done. There's something about saying, Lord, forgive me for the sin of losing my temper. Forgive me for the sin of having that bad attitude. Forgive me for the sin of that jealousy in my heart. Forgive me of that sin of not forgiving. Forgive me of that sin. See, it makes us just sort of just cringe a little bit. We, 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 forgive me for being jealous. Forgive me for, and we throw out the word, but when you add the sin of jealousy or the sin of forgive me for losing my temper today. Now how about forgive me for the sin of losing my temper today. You see, when you identify what you did as wrong as being sinful, you're more, the Holy Spirit is trying to reveal that to you. You're more likely to confess it. You're more likely to repent of it realizing that what you did was sin. And sin is what nailed Jesus to the cross. And it's not just, I lost my temper. I had a bad attitude. Lord, forgive me. I, I didn't get along with my sister today. No, Lord, forgive me. I sinned in how I treat my sister today. I sinned in how I acted to my wife today. I sinned in the way I treated my husband today. I sinned. And uh, God says, repent of that, uh, which means what? Turn away from that sin because it doesn't belong in your life. If you want direction, if you want guidance, if you want to be able to be a specialist and make wise choices under pressure, you've got to be willing to clean up uh, your life. Let me give you, give you one more. Uh, next one. Uh, so how, how, what's our plan to make wise decisions under pressure? you got to clean up your heart, your life. And ask the Spirit of God, confess, and then repent. Number two, bring your desires to a position of neutrality. Bring your desires to a position of neutrality. What's that mean? This can be a real battle when our desires for a particular course of action is real strong. You can want something so bad, you can convince yourself that it's God's will because you desire it so much. And so you want to ask God, as you're trying to make wise choices under pressure, then you've got to make sure that your desires, your emotions are neutral. You don't, you don't have an opinion. You don't have a wish list. Uh, you don't have a, a want list. They're neutral. If we want to receive God's guidance, we must be willing to yield our preferences to Him and say, God, I want to know what you want me to do. I want to know uh, where, where you want me to go. I want, you to, I want to know where you want me to work. I want you to know where you want me to, to buy that house. I want you to let me know what you want me to do with my life. That's where you come to the place in your life where your desires are neutral. You say, well, that's really going to mess up my plan for life. Oh, but this is how you make decisions, wise decisions, under pressure. Too often we let everything else decide where we're going. Since when uh, does um, uh, our job dictate the will of God? 
Since when does uh, our, uh, our age dictate the will of God? Since when does uh, our family dictate the will of God? Well, all my family's over here, so I guess I'm going to move where all my family is. Since when do they dictate the will of God? Now, it may be the will of God, but they shouldn't be the deciding factor for the will of God. So we've got to put our desires in neutrality. The first time you voice these words, I want to know what you want me to do, uh, you may not mean it. You may not mean it because you're so focused on having what you want that you probably don't want what God wants for you at this stage of your life. But at least you're taking the first step. You recognize, I do want what God wants. You may not mean it, like I said initially in your heart, but the more you desire to do God's desire, then the more that desire becomes sincere. The more that desire becomes real uh, in your heart. Uh, God hears this kind of prayer, and you can trust God to guide you if you keep coming to Him with a mind and heart that's in a neutral position. Neutral position. As you're walking in the way, God's able to guide you and direct you. It's much easier to direct a moving vehicle to go a certain way than a vehicle that's standing still. So as you're walking in the way, God then can help guide and direct the choices you make. Uh, I've, I've said this many times over the years as you seek to find God's will uh, for your life. Uh, don't write on a piece of paper all the things that you want God to give you. Because it may not be what God wants to give you, and you may be limiting what God wants to give you based upon what you think you deserve or want from God. Uh, God has an exceeding abundance that he wants to make available to us. So don't write all these things down and say, all right, God, here's all the things I want. Would you please sign this, give permission, give approval, give acceptance, and, and we'll be good to go. Just sign right here, initial right here, and we're good to go. I won't bother you anymore. That's what we think about the will of God. And then we re-look at our paper and say, well, maybe that was asking a little bit much there and a little bit much there and a little bit much there. And so we scratch off a few and say, all right, God, how about now? Can, can you uh, initial this? And still no initial until finally, after trying to negotiate with God, we finally say, you know what, I'm wasting my time. We get a blank piece of paper and we sign our name on the blank piece of paper. We say, God, here it is. Here's my life. Can you fill in the paper, what you want, what you desire, what your goal, what your dream, what your ambitions are, my name's at the bottom, and I'll trust you to fill in the blanks of my life. I don't need to fill in everything and say, God, would you approve this for me? God says, I want your desires to be neutral. What's that mean? I have no desires, but his desires. So how do you know what his desires are? You won't until you trust him with a blank piece of paper that you've already said, God, my name's here. I've signed it. You fill in the blanks. You fill in the paper. And here it is. And God will then begin to put the pieces of the puzzle of our lives together. And little by little, it won't look like it's supposed to be initially as a puzzle comes together. But as it begins to take shape and form, all of a sudden you'll say, wow, God, that's amazing. That's far beyond what I ever imagined that I could have done with my life. Had I wrote down on the paper what I thought would have been a best scenario, this far exceeds it. And I've trusted you with my life. My signature is a, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a testimonial that I'm trusting you to write what you want for my life, what you desire for my life, what your plans are for my life. We've got to be a people of knowledge. That's a specialist. That's making wise choices under pressure, under pressure. And sometimes we're good at making pressure decisions, sometimes we're not. And as a Christian, we better become a master, a specialist in making wise choices because you don't always have the option to go and take a two-week sabbatical and seek God's will and direction concerning, God, what do you want me to do? I want to do your will. God says, no, sometimes you got to make a quick decision, and it better be a right choice because there's a lot at stake. Your life and everyone else that's looking to you as a role model, as an example, and that's following in your footsteps, 
you better be a specialist. You better have wisdom. Don't live life without it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. We do pray that uh, you would take the truths of your word. Our desire, we know from a mental mindset that we need wisdom. We know that. We recognize in the big decisions of life, we need wisdom. But Lord, we need wisdom in every area of every moment of every day of our lives. Lord, we're going to need wisdom uh, later on as we go home and later on at home tonight and as we go to bed and throughout the night and the morning, we're going to need wisdom. And so, Father, I pray that we would be a people, uh, Lord, that, uh, that to understand the importance of making smart choices. Smart choices to be a people who among you is wise, endued with knowledge. He's a specialist. They know how to make decisions under pressure. Lord, help us to be that kind of Christian. Our heads are bowed tonight. Our eyes are closed. God has spoken to our hearts. Let's all stand this evening as we have our invitation. And everyone's standing. No one leaving. No one talking. But God has spoken to your heart. Will you respond? Will you allow God to do a work in your heart tonight? Are you a specialist when it comes to wisdom? Are you making right choices when put under pressure? When your family gathers together and begins to place pressure on you, are you making right choices? When you're at work around the co-workers and the pressure's on, are you making right choices? When you go in for a surgery, we sure hope that surgeon can make good choices under pressure. We sure hope those soldiers going off to battle can make some good choices under pressure. There's going to be some pressure moments. It's going to push you hard. It can inflate a tire or it can deflate your confidence. It can cause pain or it can stop blood. It can stop bleeding when pressure is applied properly. So pressure is not a bad thing if you've learned to make wise choices in times of pressure. Young person, to keep your purity, you have to make some right choices when the pressure is on. You have to make some right choices. When you're backed against the wall, backed against the corner, you have to, to know to make right choices when under pressure. Will you stand tall or will you cave? Will you give in? Will you compromise? Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your dear people. Lord, I pray you'd bless every life that's here, those tonight that uh, may be in the parking lot listening or those that are at home live streaming. Lord, we thank you for their faithfulness, Lord, tuning in. We pray that you give us a good, blessed rest of this week, Father. Uh, Lord, help us not to forget the freedoms that we enjoy because of the faithful uh, sacrifice of those that uh, have uh, fought and died for the freedoms that we enjoy. Give us a blessed service on Sunday, Lord, please, and uh, meet with us. We pray for our country that revival uh, would come to America. We pray for revival in our own individual personal lives. Lord, do a work, please. In Jesus' name we pray.